Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning, my friends and fellow elite achievers. Welcome to Modern Leadership, the podcast where each week we sit down with authors, entrepreneurs, and leaders to explore their journey, diving into the ups, their downs, and ultimately the lessons they learned along the way. Our goal, of course, is to show that everything is figureoutable. Today's guest expert is Paige Velasquez. Paige is the CEO of Zilker Media, one of the fastest growing agencies in Texas and one of only a couple agencies I use to book guests for this podcast. As a leader in digital marketing, Paige maximizes a brand's online presence with innovative strategies. She has led digital marketing campaigns and strategies for some of the world's most recognizable authorities, including New York Times bestseller and Fortune Magazine senior editor-at-large Jeff Colvin, the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller and Hall of Fame speaker Sally Hogshead, and many others. And today, she is our Modern Leadership guest expert. Paige, so wonderful to have you. How are you? Hey, Jake. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on today. I got to ask you, how cool is it to work with some of these people like Jeff Colvin and Sally Hogshead? I mean, just great leaders. They are incredible. And, you know, working with them, I get to learn so much from them and and their content that they're putting out. And so um, it's an absolute honor to work with these leaders who are completely um, at the forefront of their industries. As CEO of a company, I think it's interesting that there seems to be this cultural shift that, you know, 20, 30 years ago, no CEO would say, I get to learn along with them, right? You would come from this position of, I I know what's going on. I'm here. I'm the CEO. But nowadays, it's good. It's it's okay for us to say as leaders, I don't know everything and I love to learn along with everybody else. Tell me a little bit about how that has been an impact in your career. Absolutely. Um, I started my leadership journey pretty young. Um, I was placed into my first leadership role at the age of 23. Um, And as we started working alongside um, a lot of these excellent leaders who were producing content um, surrounding this topic, this is just something that I have grasped onto. And I truly think that we have seen that shift especially with social media and the personal brands that are out there driving this type of content, fostering these communities. This is really where we can learn to want to learn from one another, um, crowdsource the information. um, So we are better as a society. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And you're new CEO of Zilker Media. We've talked about Zilker a lot on this podcast. Many of our guests come through your agency. You're relatively new in that position. And what I love about it is you call yourself the CEO for the Spice Girls generation. Tell us how that's a little bit different from maybe historical or traditional definitions of CEO. Sure. Um, It's a fun way to think about it. Um, I am quite younger than um, a lot of CEOs out there. Um, I just turned 27 last week. Um, and Happy our, and birthday. Our team, thank you so much. And our, and our team is that generation as well. And we're, we're learning from so many that paved the way ahead of us, but we're also living in a new environment, especially with the way um, the media landscape is now. And, and one of the mistakes I made starting out Um, so early was I would try to perfectly emulate others and hide my age. Um, But what I have learned is it's more about being yourself and tapping into your strengths. Um, So learning resiliency and confidence and empathy and vulnerability. Uh, But most importantly, the ability to listen and learn. I feel like there's this craving now in the world for lifelong learning. And that's just where we are. um, and, And we bring a little spunk to it, our generation as well. Yeah, and I agree with you. And we talk a lot about bringing millennials into the workforce and millennials are having such a positive impact on not just the workforce, but also on product development, on service, on all of these things. But let me ask you, as a young leader of maybe some followers or team members that are older than you, do you find that there's a challenge in getting your ideas to stick with people who say, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years, Paige, I think I know what I'm doing. Uh, I I, I really don't think so. Um, 
where where we are now, a lot of it's about the adaptability that you have when you're communicating with others. I feel like that is a big strength to hone in on, especially when you're in a situation where someone is more senior than you um, or there's more tenure than you. Um, But listening and learning from them, that's okay. That's okay that they might have more experience than you in one particular area. Um, As a leader, as a CEO, you cannot be great at everything. And that's something that I really value about our leadership team is that we have um, experts on our team in specific areas. And and I listen to that. And I truly think that is what makes us better as a company, as an agency to better serve our clients. And I think that says a lot more about you as a leader than it does about your team, although it is complementary to your team. And one of the strengths that you bring is this background in digital marketing and digital campaigns. And we talked before we hit record that I have a brand new law firm. We're going on just a number of months now. And two of the ways that we grow our business the most, number one is through face-to-face interactions through referral marketing. But number two is through this online strategy. And I don't know if we're doing it right. And so I'm excited to jump in and talk to you a little bit about digital marketing, the future of SEO, and so on. So how should we best start this conversation? Yeah, I think the, the best thing is understanding your, your referral base. Um, so you said mostly it's word of mouth right now. Um, in the way you've set yourself up online, one of the most important things is a lot of a lot of service businesses focus on delivering a, a great service um, once they get someone in the door. But the two places that they are not as much focused on is one, kind of that pre-engagement. So what happens when someone Googles your business name online? Um, And what happens when someone sees your name in an article? Are you discoverable? Are you differentiating yourself? And then on the back end is after you deliver and excel at that service, um, what are you doing to empower your customers or your clients to talk about you and refer you to others? And so one of these things that we talk about is there's some myths out there. And I think I might fall into some of these, uh, the stereotypical, you know, business leader that doesn't have a lot of background in SEO or digital marketing. And I believe some of these myths. And so let's talk through a couple of myths that leaders, particularly in service-based industries, face up against and what we can do to overcome them so we don't allow them to hurt our business. Sure. I think the biggest thing out there on the myth side is that that promotional content and promotional advertising will grow your business. And, and what we have seen is that is actually can be a turnoff as a service business. Well, define that for us so that we know what is promotional uh, marketing that you're referring to. Sure. That is putting out information um, with your own IP. So for example, um, as a law practice, um, say for example, you have an advertisement out there that is more um, talking about what you can do for your clients versus what the win for the client is. So this is like the chest bumping stuff. This is the look at us, we are so great type of advertising. Absolutely. And so you want to limit that to about 10% of what you're doing online. So we don't want to eliminate it totally. We want to have some of it, but 10% is a very small uh, percentage of our online appearance. Right, right. So where we really want to focus what is happening online is in two areas. Um, one One is relationship building. I think that is one of the biggest opportunities Um, that so many are missing in the current media landscape. Um, And the, and the other is, is newsjacking. So this is a term um, that talks about what is going on in the news and how can you tie that back and provide value to your audience um, based on your subject matter expertise. So newsjacking is paying attention to what's going on that's on people's minds, that's in the media, and using that as kind of a springboard to communicate what you do and who you are and tie yourself to kind of the movement, the natural momentum that that specific story or topic has. Exactly. And we see 
so much more momentum when you're using newsjacking and when you're using relationship building in your content than than if you were just going out and doing look at me promotional content. I like to think of approaching the online landscape just like you would when you were walking into a networking event or a cocktail party. You really want to integrate yourselves and the conversations and what people care about. And I've heard this before. I think the challenge that I face in doing this is I don't know what networking party to go to, right? I mean, online, there's so many parties and I, I can't be at all of them. And even if I just pick a handful of them, it feels like they're going on so quickly that I always feel like that surfer who just watched the wave pass over him going, oh, I should have paddled into that one, but I missed it. Sure. And that that's very common. It feels so overwhelming, the variety of options that we have and the amount of conversations that, that are going on that we can be part of. Um, where I really like to focus is on strategy. And, and time management, especially when you're approaching the social media landscape, is where do you focus your time? Um, is it on Twitter? And it really depends on your audience. Uh, but Twitter has great tools such as Twitter lists, where you can go in and filter um, the people that you want to look at and, and focus your time when you're on that platform, building relationships with. Is anybody really using Twitter anymore, though? I, I go on Twitter, and I'm concerned that I never see anything of interest to me. And I naturally say, if it's not of interest to me, it's not of interest to anybody, which I think is false because there's still millions of people on the platform. But you mentioned Twitter, so I wanted to ask specifically about that one. I've tweeted like 25,000 times over my career. I don't really feel like I'm getting a lot of engagement. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. Twitter is all about relationship building, and you need to have that mindset when using Twitter. Um, it, it's especially great for that peer-to-peer, um, but journalists, the media, they are all on Twitter. Um, so if you're looking to interact and say, for example, you're a subject matter expert on a specific type of law, and there is a news story that they are writing about, um, they get thousands of pitches in their inbox a day. Um, but that one person that tweets at them with that at mention, which is their username handle, um, giving value or giving a commentary on their article, they are more likely to see that before they see your pitch in their inbox. So there's kind of this push pull that we want to have when building those types of relationships before you reach out and ask them to feature you. You want to build that organic relationship with them on Twitter. And would you say then when you at mention them, you're mentioning them in your feed, you're not direct messaging them. Right. So you're mentioning them in your feed because it's valuable for your audience maybe to see um, your commentary and your take on the specific article that they're writing about. Okay. I love this. I'm, I'm glad this is one of the episodes that I'm most excited to really just dig deep for my own personal selfish reasons to say, okay, I've got a business and I know my listeners have business. So let me ask the questions that are on my mind and hopefully they'll help all the listeners. But I love diving into this one. The second thing, and I kind of alluded to it before we went down this Twitter whole. And that is, I always feel like I'm a little bit behind. You talk about news jacking. And I always feel like by the time I am aware of it, it's kind of already, I'm, I'm the last adopter. I was the last iPhone owner. I was the last, you know, I feel like I'm always behind the curve. How do I get out in front of it? One of my favorite things to do in, in because we have so much technology is, is to create Google alerts around keywords um, that I want to be notified about if there's breaking news around that topic. Um, there are also specific um, newsletters that I subscribe to in the industries where um, I am a subject matter expert. And I want to make sure if there is an update on the algorithm for Instagram, I'm one of those first people to know. So it's all about finding um, those resources that are putting out news um, where you can quickly digest what is happening and quickly react 
it to whatever news is breaking at that moment. So instead of trying to keep up with all the conversations going on Twitter, which is completely overwhelming, narrow it down to the key words that matter most to your subject matter, your industry, your expertise. All right. That's Twitter. That's social media. That's really our online identity. I want to ask you a little bit about email and how many people are really reading their emails versus just delete, delete, delete. I I, I slide left on my phone and I can delete message after message. And typically I start each morning and I know I shouldn't, but I start each morning by just going through my email, deleting, you know, 10, 20, 30 emails that I don't even want to read. I don't even open them. So is email dead? Absolutely not. And in Litmus just put out a new study that it, that they are saying email has a higher conversion rate per session than search and social combined. So email is still very powerful. So they're actually seeing higher conversions of people purchasing or engaging on email versus paid search. So paid SEO, Google, um, and paid social media advertisement combined. And so are they emailing people that are already on their list? Are they purchasing lists? Are they cold emailing people? Where, what audience are they, when they did this research, what audience are they looking at? Yeah, so they were looking at um, businesses who grew their email list organically. Um, so this, these are users that they have converted onto what we call their owned media, um, and they are purchasing them from them time and time again. Very cool. And so what they're seeing is higher engagement through these than social and uh, uh, organic search on the internet, or even you said paid search, which I think is kind of interesting because most digital marketers out there, and I get pitches all the time uh, for these types of services, are going to, trying to convince me to go the other way, to spend more time on social media. And what you're saying is I really need to cultivate my email list a little bit better. Absolutely. Email is the only place where we have a true ownership um, of the connection to our audience. So social media is great and it's a really important part of the digital landscape, but it is something that we don't own. We don't own that connection to our audience on social media. Facebook owns that audience. And, um, you know, Throughout the years, especially in 2013, when Facebook switched their alg algorithm, we learned that the hard way. Um, we had grew audiences into the millions for several of our clients. And then one day in 2013, Facebook's algorithm switched and they said, you're going to have to pay us money in order to reach this audience. So we learned the hard way that we have got to convert people from email um, from, I mean, from social media over to our email list, because that is the one way we truly ha own that connection to each individual. And I know you guys work a lot with authors and, and people who have media personalities or have products that they're trying to pitch, you know, through their email list. How about service-based businesses? How often should a service-based business be reaching out and connecting with their list and maybe sending a newsletter? How much is too much and how much is too little? So I like to say a frequency of, of once per month, um, just on a newsletter update, value-driven content is really where we've seen a sweet spot. Of course, there are times of the year for certain service-based businesses where it makes sense to reach out um, a couple of weeks in a row, um, depending on if you're rolling out a new product or, or something different like that. Um, really where you want to focus is on consistency. No matter what you do, whether it's once a month, um, once every other week, you want the communication to be consistent where your audience is, is expecting that news from you. And I've heard kind of differing points of view on whether your email newsletter should be newsletter formatted kind of with some images and a header and these kind of things versus, you know, a more traditional email that seems to be more one-to-one -one related where it's just the text. And I use a couple of different email 
providers. Uh, one is trying to encourage me to do more of the newsletter format. The other one, they don't even allow the newsletter format to go out. They say, we are going to force you into just doing text-based emails. What kind of opinion do you have on that? Um, so we do a mixture of both. Um, what we have done is is with those emails who that do have a lot of photos and graphic design, um, one thing that we've done is implement alternative text um, so that if it is emailed to a server that does not allow for that picture to be viewed or there's not enough service on someone's phone, um, they're still able to engage in the message without completely missing the entire email. And that's something that I caution a lot of businesses and individuals on is when you get into design on email marketing, um, it gets a little complicated and you want to make sure that whatever is coming across can translate to every type of email management system. Um, So if you are doing something with photos, graphic design, you really want to make sure that you're using that alternative text. So when an image doesn't come up, it describes what the picture was um, so that they're not missing the message and the messaging isn't muddy. Um, So as much as you can, you want to make sure to keep true to that newsletter format. That is the most important part of the email, no matter how beautiful it looks. If it's not valuable to the person that is opening it, you're going to get put in the trash can every time you send your email. And do you find that longer email tends to be better. I mean, sometimes I see an email like a newsletter that will have the first paragraph and then it will say, read more, click here. And other times you'll see the entire article dropped right in the text of the email. Have you noticed any difference between open and and, uh, activity rates with the two forms? We have started to see a higher um, open rate and conversion rate with shorter emails. And we're keeping this to about three paragraphs tops. Um, From there, what we have seen is we are able to link to a blog post or link to whatever service we're talking about in that email. But short is better just right now where we are in our media landscape. And when we're checking email, we don't have time to read. And especially so many people are looking on their phones. You want to make sure that you're getting all the information you need to get to them in what's called above the fold. So kind of those first two or three paragraphs. All right. That sounds like a good plan to me. How about shifting gears a little bit? I know you talk a lot about uh, Disney princesses or what Disney princess are you? What's this idea of quiz marketing and how is it a brand's best friend? So quiz marketing, and this pairs really well with email as well, Um, when you're trying to convert and grow an email list, um, it's all about the lead magnet that you have on your website. Um, So so we kind of categorize lead magnets into three categories. Um, The first one is that typical sign up here to receive news. As you can imagine, that converts at a horrific rate. Um, The second category that we see with lead magnets are white papers. So sign up to receive an infographic or a download or a free chapter. A checklist or something like that. Right, exactly. And that converts a little better. um, But unless you already have a really big following, you're not going to see a very high conversion there either. Now, the last category of lead magnet um, where we do see an insane amount of conversion is this interactive element such as a quiz or an assessment. And this has really been brought to life uh, the past several years with, with Buzzfeed and their fun quizzes. Um, As you can imagine, what kind of Disney princess are you? That's a huge conversion rate. People want to know that immediate value exchange and, and there's a lot of fun that you can have with them as well. And so when we're talking about, you know, how do we grow that email list and, and how do we grow in that connection that we have directly to our audience? It starts with the lead magnet that you have. And um, we've done this throughout the years and we've done um, several, several quizzes and some of the most popular popular have been the confidence codes. So how confident are you in the workplace? Um, We've also done the narcissism test. Um, What do you have a healthy level of narcissism? So think about um, when when you're creating a quiz, what do people want to know about themselves? What is that pure exchange of value that you can give someone from a quiz? 
a lot of people, when they land on your website, they're not ready to buy. What you need to do is find a way to extend that interaction with them. And one of the best ways to do that is by giving them immediate value through a quiz. And I think this is a great time to mention the Leadership Superpower Assessment on jakeacarlson.com. On the website, you can find what of the five leadership superpowers you lead from. And I think that to go along with what you're saying, Paige, we have found a lot of conversion that comes through people curious to know what leadership superpower they have within their, you know, what platform they lead from. And so thank you for allowing me to uh, share that, I guess, on my own podcast. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. And I actually took the quiz as well. And I, I felt like, Jake, you did such a great follow-up um, on, on nurturing after I received my results on, on what really that meant and what that result meant and how I can continue um, and to learn more about um, my superpower. Oh, very cool. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, while I love having this conversation, I would love to do like a screen share with you, Paige, and have you go through my website and say, this is good. This is good. This is terrible. You need to change it. I would do this differently. Uh, But alas, this is a podcast and many of our listeners need to get into work or get off the treadmill or whatever they're doing right now. And so it is now time for us to shift gears to our final segment. And that is the learning from leaders. How does that sound. Sounds great. Perfect. All right. Our first question then for you is the book currently on your Kindle or bedside table. What are you reading these days? So right now I am reading The Coaching Habits and this is by Michael Bungay Stainer. Um, The subtitle of this, which I love is Say Less and Ask More. It has been um, a huge book for me, especially um, in 2020. Well, and thank you for bringing that up because it was a life changer for me, a business and career changer for me. And I actually have the seven essential questions for better business communication printed out and hanging on my wall right now because I love that book. It's such a fantastic book. Yeah, I keep a note section on the side of my computer um, every day that I look at. All right. Our second question then is your leadership superpower from the leadership superpower assessment. Mine was inspirational, um, which, which is really cool to see uh, the keywords here, commitment, curiosity, passion, influence, and vision. Um, so, so I enjoyed that quiz. Well, and as a CEO, especially of a PR company that does a lot of marketing and helping a lot of people get out there, I think that inspiration, it doesn't translate to be extrovert. What it translates to be is inspiring people to move to a higher level. And I think that's such a fabulous leadership platform for you as CEO to lead from. Absolutely. All right. How about a leadership philosophy quote or mantra, something that you live by? So, so this quote is from Henry Ford um, and it's, it goes, anyone who stops learning is old and anyone who keeps learning stays young. And why do you think that's so important? I am just, I think lifelong learning and and learning from others as much as you can, um, that's incredibly important um, for for our culture, for our businesses, for our society. Um, And of course, I always want to stay young, so (laughs) I'm going to keep learning. Yeah, and I think it's that attitude and that mentality that's now throughout our workforce that is allowing us to innovate, to create, to do things differently and allowing people to lead at 27 years of age and still take on people who have have been in the role for 30 years, learn from them, but also guide the company. And so I think that's a tremendous quote. Thank you for sharing it. Our final question then is the book that you most often gift, refer or recommend to friends, family and colleagues. Um, this one is Attention Management by Mara Thomas. So this is one um, that our team has worked on this year, and we have gone through together as a team. It completely flipped my perspective on productivity and dialed in on what the real issue is, which is managing my attention. Um, so this is something that I have given to anyone who can listen, especially when they're feeling so overwhelmed by you know what's going off on their phone every two seconds. And, and how do they manage their time? And so um, this is something that has changed not only my perspective, but the way our team works as well. And I've got a special treat for the modern leadership audience. Actually, ironically, Paige, today 
I interviewed Mara Thomas for the podcast, but her episode isn't scheduled to go live for 10 weeks following this one. So it actually seems like an eternity. But in 10 short weeks, which is three months, two and a half months, the audience will get a chance to actually hear from Mara. And we dive right into that topic of not time management but attention management and the impact that it can have. And I just love the, the concept of the book. And thank you for, for bringing it up and, and allowing us to plug one of our future guests at this time. Yeah, she, she is incredible. And, and like I said, this has completely shifted my perspective on productivity. Well, and the great thing is I get to read this book two and a half months before the audience does. And so uh, I'm just excited to jump into it. Paige, it's been wonderful to have you on the show. Before we let you go, how can we find out more about you? How can we connect? And of course, where can we go to find out more about Zilker Media? Sure. Um, So we actually have a personal brand quiz that you can take on our website, which is um, zilkermedia.com. And you can see where your platform ranks in the areas of the new media landscape. And we break it out into rented media, which is your social media channels, earned media, um, which is more of that word of mouth PR hits that you might have. And then lastly, your owned media, which is your website, your email list. Um, So you can go to zilkermedia.com and take that quiz. All right. Well, I'm already Googling over to it right now. We're going to link it up on the show notes because everybody needs to take this quiz, including myself. And, and I really look forward to seeing you know, what I can do to pump my law firm a little bit more. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. You are a tremendous expert and it's been a wonderful to have you t- with us today. Thank you so much, Jake. Thank you so much for having me on. All right, my friends, that was an interesting episode. You know, as I went into it, I said, I'm going to do something different. I have a business. I want to figure out how these principles apply directly to my business. And I hope that they translate well to your business as well. The goal of this podcast, the goal of modern leadership is to show that everything is figure outable. And we as business leaders, we as owners of business have so many different obstacles that we're trying to overcome. We have so many voices telling us you need to do this or you need to do that. And it's great, I think, to sometimes sit down and have somebody walk us through, Jake, this is what you need to do. Of course, everything that we talked about on this episode can be found at jakeacarlson.com slash ML159, episode 159. We will link everything up on the show notes so you can find it in one easy place. And until next week, I want to wish you the very best of days, an even better life. And of course, remember, everything is figure outable. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Uh-huh.